Okay. So, Minoru Yamasaki, 1913-1986. This was a man who really fought hard to arrive where he arrived. I read rather quickly on Wikipedia, and you can too, of course. He really struggled, you know, he worked all kinds of jobs, very low wages, uh, while he was also going to school. So really he started from the bottom and, and being a Japanese around the Second World War was not a good thing at all in the United States because of the conflict, because of Pearl Harbor, because of uh, everything that happened then. You know, it was not a good thing to be Japanese, and he was. And so he struggled a lot, but where he arrived, you know, building, uh, you know, large scale buildings uh, all over the United States and not only in the United States, including the, the notorious um, World Trade Center. So there is something to admire about such a biography because against all odds, he succeeded. No, he's not Le Corbusier, he's not Frank Lloyd Wright, he's not Miss, he's not Khan, but he succeeded. And he built, you know, at least in terms of quantity, as much as they did. And he really started from the bottom, from the very bottom. But the problem I have with him is that, but, you know, it's easy for me here to, to, to formulate uh, some form of criticism. Uh, the truth is, if you want to function in the world, if you want to build, you know, you have to assume the, you know, the conditions of your time. He worked for a capitalist, uh, capitalist society, and his architecture is uh, accordingly very corporate. But he tried to do something, you know, within the, the commercialism of the corporate structure. He still tried to do something. And in this respect, I, I cannot respect him. We'll arrive at some works. You'll see he's, uh, you know, uh, rather predictable, but with slight interventions that show a quest for quality, meaning for architecture. So Minoru Yamasaki was born today on the 1st of December in 1913 and he died in 1986, so he died at 73. Uh, he could have lived longer. Was a Japanese-American architect best known for designing the original World Trade Center in New York City and several other large-scale projects. Yamasaki was one of the most preeminent architects of the 20th century. Now, this is a very demanding and powerful uh, um, phrase, isn't it? He and fellow architect Edward Darrell Stone are generally considered to be the two master practitioners of new formalism. Maybe one day we'll talk also about Edward Darrell Stone. It's true, they are a little bit uncomfortable because there is something in their architecture that is not very conducive to, to being liked because it's uh, rather concerned with some kind of a classical or classicist uh, modernism. Anyway, this was the man, the man who really washed dishes at the beginning of his life in order to earn a, an education in architecture. And I think we have to admire such people. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, yes, the Japanese are very hardworking. I work myself for a Japanese company in, in New York, so I, I know what I'm saying. They are far, very hardworking. Uh, the Chinese as well. That's why they arrive to the economies where they are. You know, uh, it's not an accident. Anyway, um, but he lived in the United States. And as I said, uh, a difficult time uh, for him, and he still succeeded. I, this is a formulation I invented today or yesterday. No, I actually thought of it a few, I don't know, a few months ago. Because if we have critical regionalism, maybe we could also have critical globalism. But his architecture is rather some kind of a non-critical globalism. And this is where the problem is. But 
But there is a but because his globalism or globalist architecture does have some nuances which could be interpreted maybe in a rather lyrical and un, unprecise, I mean, lacking precision way um, as being, um, you know, slightly critical. Now I'll show, I'll begin with a synagogue. Uh, it was difficult for me to start this presentation because I don't quite like his work. And um, I, I didn't have the patience to, to, to start it chronologically. I just plunged it to, into his work, so to speak. And I, I, this is a work that, um, you know, had a little bit of interest for me. So I begin with it. Then later on, I become almost chronological. So the North Shore Congregation Israel, it's a synagogue and it's, you know, it has a certain predictability because of the rhythm and the, you know, the repetition, but I wouldn't truly really say it's not architecture. You know, there are here elements of a certain, uh, you know, with a certain dignity and, uh, you know, maybe even with a certain beauty. And, and this man actually who was Japanese, uh, seem to have an interest in the Gothic, and uh, and uh, but but it's a transformed Gothic. It's not it's not uh, it's not a pastiche in any way. But and this uh, this was not so usual, really. I mean, around the time where he built this, you know, I don't know, fifties or sixties, you know, I, I don't think too many architects uh, took this road. Uh, the problem is, I think, a little bit, is exactly the absence of that critical side or a certain, um, I don't know, uh, roughness even. I mean, there is something a little bit academic and indeed formal. That's why he and Daryl Stone are considered the two masters of the new formalism. But there is some, still something here that is not to be ignored, I think. And, uh, you know, it is a, there is elegance here. Uh, and there is a flying spirit a little bit if we look at, uh, you know, above. So I, th I would say it is architecture. We might not like but this particular kind of uh, architectural language, but it's still not to be ignored, I think. I mean, even the interior, you know, and also interesting, this is a synagogue, but it pendulates precariously somehow between, uh, you know, uh, what is supposed to serve and even Islam in a way, and also a certain kind of bio-architecture. It's almost uh, erotical a little bit, you know, you have the vulva that it's abstracted, but, but uh, it's more than just, uh, you know, an illustrative, uh, you know, uh, religious architecture. No, it's, uh, it's sublimated, I think, to an extent. So uh, if it has any problem, and it might not have, but for me is that it, it is a little bit, you know, a little bit, it doesn't surprise me too much, and it's a little bit academic. But uh, still, I think it's... Uh, He's not, I don't think he was really a, a, a banal architect. And, uh, you know, I mean, look even the, the handrail, you know, he has a certain elegance, you know, and it, it is reticent. It's some kind of a reticent uh, Art Nouveau. Uh, I think it's, it's nice. Anyway. Um, well, the ceiling, you know, the, the picture is not so great because the resolution is not great, but uh, you can still glance at a ceiling that approximates uh, the ceiling of a modernized uh, version of the Gothic cathedral. Uh, it's not a cathedral. Uh, Dan. Yes. Uh, if you go two slides back, uh, yeah, this one. If you uh, see the structure, uh, it's amazing. I mean, see the walls and the way there is glass and where the uh, wall touches above there is glass so it's uh, the structure is amazing i mean uh, it uh, the way he's given glass in the walls and where it touches on the ceiling uh, there it's not holding the uh, the ceiling 
those yes, uh, those yes, cup like yes. cup cup like uh, uh, structures are actually holding the ceiling yeah it's it's very elegant and um, yeah. you know it it makes sense you know it's lyrical but it's also rational yeah so yeah i i think he did, i think he did a, a good job but if you look at the building you wouldn't say this is a synagogue actually it could function also for a church and maybe even a mosque no what do you think i i think it's uh, too erotic i mean the way uh, the previous slide uh, to this uh, i don't know how the clients agreed to these kind of uh, symbolic <laughs> uh, elements i don't know well you know um, i you know <laughs> any religion i think if it is if it is honest uh, cannot uh, you know uh, say goodbye to to biology and even physiology is uh, you know it's life it's it's what it is and uh, even if it's about spirituality spirituality is connected with everything else you cannot have a spiritual spirituality without the body and uh, it's a long discussion but this is a building built for the followers of uh, uh, avram uh, abraham you know uh, so uh, it could be, it could function also for for uh, the other two monotheistic religions anyway um so that's why i began with this building because i'm i'm, I'm it's, it, it would be hard for me to say something against it i i kind of like it you know but what we see here this is islam this is islam pure and simple and he did it in a synagogue it's actually amazing and it's actually worth uh, talking about and contemplating it he brought islam into the synagogue and uh, you know i'm surprised he got away with it you know uh, but i i think great great architecture or good architecture is able to transcend the the separations the frontiers between um, you know uh, countries on one hand between religions on the other hand between the sexes between the ages because it's about it's exactly about that it's about unity bringing things together as opposed to declaring uh, all kinds of nationalism or other kinds of separation so i, I think he did a good job here and in, indeed I, i am still surprised that uh, he got away with it you know because this building could could function also as a mosque uh in fact uh, with much more ease with more ease i would say maybe not not much more anyway the northern northwestern national life building uh you see already his preferences for some kind of a modernistic uh, gothic you know at, at the top Uh, and uh, this is a, a, a little bit unusual considering that he was a japanese i mean he was born in seattle he was born in the united states but from japanese immigrants so he had japanese blood but he understood i think the something of the of the fascination that uh, the gothic could uh, could generate and uh, he applied this uh, fascination everywhere even at the world trade center will arrive there the, at the bottom you can see something that relates to relates to this very uh, uh, aesthetics that we see here now of course we could say what is he doing here because this is a national life building it's a business it's a it's a corporation why does it look like uh, you know a parliament building or a, you know even some kind of a religious structure you look at that i mean here i i would say there is a certain level of uh, rhetorics not to say uh, uh, you know in authenticity or demagogy because you know this kind of triumphalist entrance to a building that is destined actually to making money seems to me a little bit uh, questionable you know uh, they, this these insurance companies they know what i mean we know what they are doing right they they uh, they make money by frightening people that if they don't if they are not insured they will go straight to hell or they will die very young and uninsured 
Uh, I mean, I know because when I turn on the radio, why do I, what do I hear? Are you over 50? Are you insured? You are not insured? Wow. So they try to frighten you. And, uh, and why? Because they want your money. That's why. So to make this kind of triumphalist, uh, you know, uh, interest into the building, uh, I mean, it's more glorious and, and more emphatic than going to, into the largest cathedral. So uh, here is the, his complicity with uh, capitalism and with uh, the corporate mentality and with uh, with money, essentially. You know, uh, otherwise the building, I mean, if you look at this building, you could even say this is the parliament building in I don't know what country. Well, it's not. It's, uh, you know, it's a corporation here for making money, you know, an insurance company. <laughs> I don't think the insurance companies uh, deserve, I'm not saying that uh, buildings for insurance companies should by ne necessarily be by definition ugly. But uh, there is an emphasis here that I think it is disproportionate with uh, the very essence of the work that is done in this building. Look, this is a nice image, you know, it's a nice image, but you could very well say that this is a building that uh, searches for God. Well, it doesn't search for God. In fact, it searches for God's opposite, and that is money. Um, so anyway, because because I kept, uh, I kept coming back to Charles Baudelaire, but I really love Baudelaire's uh, intuition in the poem uh, L'Etranger or The Stranger, where the poet is asked, what do you like the most? And at one moment he's asked, do you love go uh, gold? And he says, I hate it in as much as you hate God. In other words, he places money and, and, and God dichotomically. He separates them. You cannot love one and the other. You either love money or you love God. Now you could say these are the excesses of an exalted uh, spirit, the poet. Maybe, but the poets, it has been said, are always right at the end. And I believe he was right, Baudelaire. Of course, he also talked probably from the position of not having money. Somebody told me, well, you know, bankers always talk about art. And artists always talk about money because we always talk, always talk about, about what we don't have. Anyway, there is some elegance here. I, I just regret that uh, all this glory is actually for something that is very lucrative and prosaic, essentially, and, 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 and pedestrian and banal because measurable. That's why it is measurable. Money is not about immeasurableness, it's about measurableness. And uh, that's it. Now, the Pacific Science Center in Seattle, this is an earlier work from 1962. Here he uses um, um, yeah, some kind of a, uh, idealized version of what the science is supposed to be. You see that he's playing again with the Gothic references. I would, if, if I look at this picture, I would say, well, what is science? I will ask myself, what is science? Scientists, great scientists, I think at bottom are poets. Scientists in their own way, maybe they also search for God through scientists. So in that sense, maybe a certain reference to the cathedral, to the uh, forest of columns, uh, to the gathering of the foliage of the trees together at the top. It's, it's some kind of a longing for the beyond, for the unknown. And in that sense, yes, science uh, uh, is not so far away, actually, from art, except that it uses different means. So it's an unusual uh, building also, or what he did here, there's some kind of a stage design, an architectural stage design, which has this symbolism. And I'm surprised it was built, and I'm actually happy it was built like this, because it shows in a way the idealism of, of, of true science. And I believe true science is idealistic. A true scientist is actually very uninterested in lucrative matters. He's a, he's a dreamer. 
who, you know, searches for something and uh, that's what it is, just as the artist does, but with different means. So when I look at this building, I would say uh, Minoru Yamasaki is not such a banal architect, actually, because he also used architectural metaphors. And, uh, you know, nobody forced him, I'm sure, uh, in the program was not mentioned uh, what we see here, which is perhaps the most important part of the building. You know, the part that is actually not a building. In a way, the unseen part of the scientific activity, he uh, brings physicality to it in this form. Otherwise, the building is, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, we could say it's new formalism, and it's, I think I would say it's, it's, it's acceptable. But I, the most important part is still, I think, what we see here, maybe not in this particular picture. And here it is how, uh, you know, the, the building came into being, you know, we prefabricated uh, elements of very large dimensions. I mean, this, this, this very fragment itself has a certain dignity and even a certain fluidity and, even, and a certain beauty. No, I, I think he, he was good at, at uh, abstracting the Gothic and uh, modernizing it more than other architects who maybe tried the same. Well, this shows us that actually the American society at that time, at least, had a had a certain idealism in a strange way coupled with the pragmatism inherent to capitalism. Now, this is a I don't know exactly. It's another corporation, the Horace Mann Educators Corporation. I don't know. I mean, you know, why not? But uh, it's a typical North American. Uh, you know, uh, corporate building like those on the left. It's well done, but um, it doesn't move me too much. Um, but even here, it is shown that this architect kind of uh, knew what he was doing. And, uh, you know, it, the building, it might not be a genius building, but it has a certain coherence, integrity, uh, clarity. Now, a temple uh, from Michigan, uh, this one is different. You see, so he was built, he was able actually to, to, to change his uh, architectural language depending on the function he was trying to, uh, you know, honor. This one also is a little bit blunt, but uh, uh, Depends. There are some pictures I didn't see it with my own eyes, except through, uh, you know, uh, the web. But and even here, certain eroticism helps the building from becoming uh, totally flat. So I guess um, you know Minoru Yamasaki uh, had a certain you know liveliness within himself. Otherwise. Uh, uh, at least as a desiderata, if, uh, if not more. Um, so yeah, when you look at this image, when you look at this building, you do say this is a temple of some sort. Or, I mean, you cannot say it's, uh, I don't know. It, it does look like a temple. Especially in this picture. Well, this picture was taken by someone with a certain sensitivity as a photographer. Now, these two towers, the Century Plaza Towers in Los Angeles, 1975, yeah, they are typical corporate uh, buildings, but they do have a certain level of elegance and, uh, you know, even, even dignity. So I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't easily dismiss them. Yes, you know, it's not such a huge difference between this building here and this building here. But when you look at it, 
there seems to be a sensitivity and that is not totally different to what is beyond what then, is uh, yes yeah they look like triangular towers they are they are not square and uh, yes, the way he yeah the way he's oriented it uh, that itself is uh, quite nice uh, it's like an open book and that a slit in the middle of two buildings that is that that must be gorgeous i mean two uh, very uh, coming very close and a, 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 a empty space between the two buildings maybe i don't know <laughs> no no you are right they are triangular in plan and uh, and uh, you know i didn't think of of this of uh, the you know the the association with an open book but i think your interpretation is valid uh, vatsal thank you and you you talked uh, eloquently about it and i'm sure yamasaki would have been happy to hear it so here here they are um uh, yeah so uh, you know uh, this architect uh, i think he deserved the the name uh, an architect but i think you realize now that despite the certain sophistications and a certain uh, sensitivity there isn't really here a critical stance you know and when frampton wrote about the critical regionalist he referred to a regionalist that 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 try to escape the predictability of its localism and here we have a globalist architecture but if there is some kind of a hint towards some kind of a, in, in quotation marks in between quotation marks uh, criticism is this uh, the elegance that that the fact that uh, these buildings seem to say okay we have a you know a bureaucratic function uh, maybe a prosaic function but through beauty or through elegance or through dignity we can uh, elevate the the status of the building and in that sense there is some kind of implicit uh, you know so called only so called uh, criticism i don't know if he designed this but there is, there is more elegance here than here that's obvious anyway the bok tower in tulsa 1975 uh, also uh, i would say a fine tower you know it's 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 you know you would say nothing special but uh, he chose the right fenestration and there is a, a certain rhythm on the facade which is discreet these buildings left and right are banal his building is not banal i don't know about the first floor or i don't know mezzanine or whatever it is there you see this classicist Uh, element in his architecture turns me a little bit off because it's it's it's, it's too predictable and it's um, I, 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 it's i don't really think it's truly felt or viscerally felt it's too yeah uh, in a way too convenient we'll arrive at another skyscraper that he built where, where he's a little more courageous but uh, because i don't think the prism the modern prism can sit well on these arches is because they are two different worlds really but 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 maybe he built this closer to postmodernism uh, philip johnson also did this sort of thing but in a more uh, vulgar and outrageous way with his atnt building in manhattan this uh, academy is, turns me off a little bit in, in, in he, but where he is just modern uh, i would say he is convincing now another tower in seattle 1977 this one has a, a base that is um, very different and probably required a lot of uh, engineering and a lot of money you see and i don't i am not so sure he was very inspired here either because i don't know it, this is not a table you know where you have the bottom of the table done in 
maybe something like this. It's not a pedestal. So to put a whole office tower on top of a pedestal seems to me a little bit uh, awkward and, and strange. I, I know he wanted to do something more interesting, but uh, I don't think it's very convincing here. It's almost like he built a pedestal and then he came with a whole tower and, and from above and, and, and placed it on top of the pedestal. It's something um, off, I, I would say, for my taste. But he built it and it stands. <laughs> what can we say? He had good engineers and good money and then, you know, it worked. Anyway. The Federal Reserve Bank, Richmond, 1978, other tower. I, I would prefer uh, this, this kind of tower than the, the extravaganza of the, of the previous one. Because this is more honest in a way and without unnecessary embellishment, so to speak. It's just a, you know, a prism that doesn't want to say that it is anything else but a prism. So it's that, fine. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, sorry to be interrupting so it's, much. But if you go back one slide uh, uh, to that pedestal, one more slide. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you see the edge of this building, uh, the, 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 uh, 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 the kind of arch, the way he chamfered it, uh, the detail there, uh, that's done, I presume, because yeah, you can see the chamfered edge of the, uh, the, uh, the pedestal, the arch of that pedestal, uh, it's, it's chamfered. That's a sm small detail, but he's done it so that that line may not come as a perfect arch. So he chamfered that edge. Similarly, chamfered the edges of the buildings also, because uh, he may not get a straight line. I don't know. That, I that's, mean, yeah, that's my been, interpretation. He should have been able. I don't know why he uh, avoided that. But um, yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, okay. I don't know why exactly what is happening in this huge. I mean, you see how tall this thing is. Yeah, it doesn't have any window. It's like uh, eight floors. <laughs> floor but but floor. check the edge of it. The edge, the way he chamfered it. Yeah, I know. You <laughs> you concentrate on the edge. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's maybe important. So okay, the Federal Reserve Bank, Richmond. We saw this. And uh, this is a building in Minneapolis, 100 Washington Square. I prefer him doing this sort of thing. I, I think here he was okay. He was honest. He was uh, Cartesian, uh, but there is a certain harmony uh, in this box. The box has a certain harmony, I believe. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's not very unpredictable, but uh, maybe it's not supposed to be. And it's executed impeccably. And uh, he emphasizes the corner in a, you know, in a way which is, you know, attracts some attention. And uh, the, the structure is, uh, you know, uh, significantly important because you see, it seems that this whole thing is supported just at the corners. And uh, yeah. No, no, uh, North Americans are good at building tall buildings. In fact, I, I, I thought, you know, they can build a skyscraper in Manhattan in, in three months. And the same skyscraper in Frankfurt am Main in, in Germany would take at least two years. And we are talking about Germany and still they can do it. The, the North Americans are, they, they know how to, to, to build these tall buildings. And you know, they, they, the building sites are really is the, the the the, the uh, projection of the of the floor plan on the on the on the earth on the on, on uh, and it it's, it doesn't extend in in New York City a skyscraper grows upwards without any kind of misery around it and you know if the same building would be built in another country probably on a square kilometer you would have a lot of activity going on no. The North Americans know how to build these buildings very smoothly and very quickly. And of course, with the help of the Native American Indians, I, I read that um, apparently uh, above a certain floor, the white men cannot handle it very well. So they hire 
professionals, uh, Native American uh, Indians, who have no fear of, of high altitudes, and they can work, you know, even on the 100th floor. A very highly paid, of course, uh, and they should be highly paid because they can do what uh, the white man cannot do. Now, Torre Picasso in Madrid, 1988. He built such a torre, such a tower in, uh, in Madrid, and here it is. Not very different from the previous one. I actually like a little bit more the, the previous one than this one. Not, not, be, not the whole building, but what is happening here at the top is a little bit bothering me uh, because it's a little bit too conventional. I would say. Okay. Pardon? Um, I think that ending at the top is a little bit too conventional for my taste. If you would have been to end the building uh, without this uh, academic uh, portion here, I think it would have been better. But, uh, you know, this is my opinion. It is subjective. Maybe I can find some justification. But all in all, I, I, I do think his, his architecture is, uh, is, uh, is uh, some kind of a non-critical uh, uh, globalist architecture. And, uh, you know, that's why he got so many commissions, but that, that's also why, uh, you know, so few people know of him actually, because maybe otherwise, if he had a critical edge, uh, because he did have the skill, and I'm sure he worked very hard uh, being a Japanese, uh, but uh, because that critical edge um, often uh, was absent, um, you know, yes, he built a lot. Yes, he had success. But uh, uh, again, you know, instead of instead of reflecting on the on the nature of the office tower, also from from a more uh, adversarial or, or critical side. Why? Well, I, I I would say because capitalism in its essence is problematic. You know, there isn't really so much nobility in the act of making profit. And, and, and what does he do instead? He imagines these uh, rather placid and predictable arches as if here we are having some kind of, a, you know, if not a god, uh, then some kind of a nobleman or a king or a queen. I mean, these, these academic references to an ordered world uh, bother me a little because capitalism is about something else. Unless, unless you say, well, the corporation is the king and I accept the king and I even applaud the king. And I think that's a problem. You know? uh, I like the middle part of his buildings, but I don't like the bottoms and in some cases the tops. But the, the middle part, which is, you know, in essence, the very building, are okay. So this is the building in, uh, in, in Madrid. Strange, I, I, I visited Madrid. I, I never saw the mountains for some reason. I was probably blind. I, I, I was very surprised to actually learn that this is Madrid. I, um, it's true, I didn't spend a lot of time there, but I spent a few days. And the, the, this kind of image uh, takes me by surprise. Then that is photo Photoshop. There is no uh, snow mountains in Madrid. I don't okay. Think. So then, uh... <laughs> and Ma Madrid has, has such horrible buildings. I mean, I've been to Madrid also, and uh, very commercial buildings and very repetitive. Uh, Madrid doesn't have good architecture. Uh, I don't know, uh, but all I have to say between Barcelona and uh, Madrid, I like Madrid more. I don't know why. Um, the old town, the old okay. man, let me let me move away from because yes, the, the, it's strange, you know, I, I'm such a naive uh, man, I believe anything. So I didn't ask myself, how come the mountains disappeared? I saw this was a picture <laughs> looking the other way, you know, I don't know. Anyway, it never crossed my mind that indeed, you know, it's a Photoshop picture. I took it for granted. And in fact, I questioned myself that I, how come I didn't see the mountains when I visited uh, Madrid? Uh, anyway, um, yeah, I think the building has some, some elegance, 
but I still have problems here with the top and other also the bottom. Otherwise, if you would have left it just like Miss van der Rohe would have done it, it would have been a much better building, in my opinion. I really think he has a, had a problem with the base of the buildings and with the very ending of the buildings at the top. Not always, like in those cases where he used uh, you know, the Gothic paradigm or like in the first synagogue that I showed, there he was able to handle it graciously and convincingly because he, he thought in three dimensions. But for a tower is a little bit more difficult. At World Trade Center, and we'll arrive there soon, uh, he was uh, a little better than here, I would say. And uh, yes, you see the heliport on the top of the Picasso Tower. Um, anyway, um, strangely, I mean, you know, Picasso was Catalan, was not, you know, but, but he deserved a tower, I guess, even in Madrid, because he was Picasso indeed. Maybe you know that Picasso's name derived from his mother's name and not from his father's. He, he changed his name. Just like Le Corbusier, except that Le Corbusier chose his name not directly from his mother, but from an unc unc uncle, apparently related to his mother. And other architects too, Miss van der Rohe also took his name from his mother. Rohe is his mother's name. Uh, his father's name actually is Miss, and he placed it at the beginning. Uh, and it looks like a first name. No, it's actually his you know, family name given by his father. And in German, it means loser. Yeah, this I don't like. I, I, I don't like this, uh, this is academic and it's too explicit and it's too, I don't know, uh, predictable. I don't know why he did it. I think he had some kind of a nostalgia for history, for, uh, you know, Bozar in a way, the Bozar system. I prefer him from here up all the way to uh, what happened at the top. And this is the, the, the plan. It's okay, I would say the plan, what can we do? In, in case of an office tower, uh, you, you, you can't really do a lot or too much. Anyway, uh, so we move forward. We were in Madrid, uh, we are still are in Madrid, the mountains are gone, thanks Patsal. Uh, I'm such a dreamer and a naive man, you know, I mean, if you put there, you know, uh, the actually, uh, sorry to interrupt, but actually on Google, I found that uh, are some views from Madrid with the mountains Guadarrama. Uh, so on. You see, but uh, it's not Photoshop. It means, you know, from certain points of view, you don't see the mountains, but looking the other way, you see, right? That's what you say, one. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, okay, so I yeah. really, one, you made my evening because I'm not naive any longer. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> Thank you, one. I am really, I mean, my self esteem went up a little bit. Thank you. I, I totally You're appreciate welcome. it. Okay, so the Twin Towers, we inevitably arrive at the last, uh, uh, his, you know, most uh, well-known uh, work, although few people actually know that was built by Yamasaki, or uh, maybe not enough people. Anyway, you know these two towers, uh, I had been there in the shadow, I never felt tempted to really climb to the last floor. If they had a quality, and I, I think they did, is mainly the fact mainly the fact that there were two towers and not one. In other words, here he was a little bit critical. He didn't build one monolith, but two. And because of it, he created this rift in a way he diminished the, the tremendous power, not always uh, noble and deserved, of the financial uh, you know, transactions that took place in, in these two buildings because Indeed, this was about uh, trading, about commerce, about uh, making money. And, uh, you know, uh, also you have windows here, but somehow he was able to dilute the, the problematic window. And I say the problematic window, because as I said earlier, uh, some other time, uh, apparently Frank Lloyd Wright, I learned this from Alvaro Cesar said, the architecture wouldn't be difficult to do 
unless, I mean, it wouldn't be difficult to do if you didn't have to place a windows in, in the walls. What is good about uh, Yamasaki is that he created, I mean, there are windows here, but somehow the, the, the facades uh, melt down the, the individuality and the, you know, an easy reading of the windows. It's, it, they are like walls, but they are walls and also without the banal, uh, you know, uh, curtain glass wall. No, the, he, he did something, I think, of a certain value. Now, of course, he, these are huge, but, uh, or were huge, but I, 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 I think. I mean, they are a little blunt, and I would say his architecture is a little blunt, but it's not totally, you know, devoid of a certain sensitivity. Still, at the bottom, he cannot get rid of his longing for a certain kind of uh, academic, academic uh, architecture, you know, so-called classicism, and also the typical, uh, well, quasi-erotical uh, uh, Muslim, uh, Gothic uh, uh, detailing you see like here. So this whole building is actually springing from these uh, uh, elements which are, you know, uh, or where, I don't know. You can still see that this is the same man who created that uh, office tower that he placed on top of that pedestal. I still think Yamasaki had a problem with uh, translating uh, or, 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 or uh, moving forward from the base of his buildings to the middle part and sometimes ending the building. Uh, but I mean, you, you see here, the, these are the two towers here and, and here. And uh, you know, the, the Gothic influence is, 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 is perceivable, but abstracted as he used it uh, you know, in, uh, in, in other works. What I like again is the, the way he, he was able to insinuate, I, I would say the word, the correct word is insinuate the windows because it's both a wall and a, and a windowed wall, if there is such a word, windowed, as if there is a verb to window. I don't think there is, but I kind of like to talk about the windowed with an ED at the end wall. This is what this seems to be. And considering the, the, the scale uh, is, I think it works. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's unbelievable actually that these towers came down and the way they came down, no wonder there are there so many conspiracy theories uh, because it is indeed unbelievable. I remember I was in Chicago on September 11. And I was entering the building, an apartment building where I was living. And the lady told to me, did you see what happened in New York? I said, no. She said, go quickly upstairs and, and watch on TV. A plane entered the World Trade Center. I thought she was, you know, just uh, joking. But I went upstairs and it happened. My, my roommate had a TV, so I turned it on. And at that time, the second plane entered, um, uh, you know, uh, tower. And I, it, it's true, I had the feeling that this is uh, Hollywood uh, bonanza, that is some kind of, a, you know, uh, film. It was surreal. And I had a friend in New York who was going to work then when this happened. And he told me that he stopped because the traffic stopped on the highway and they all came out of their buildings, of their cars and they looked at what was happening, you know? It was surreal, it was unbelievable. How come some planes entered these buildings, you know? At, at, at this moment, I still don't believe it, you know? I, I would rather believe that the, the mountains in Madrid come and go whenever one, one wishes them to come and go than to believe what happened with the, at World Trade Center. I mean, try to imagine those so-called terrorists doing it, you know, to actually do it. It's, it's surreal, you know, how come, you know, uh, it doesn't matter for how long he prepared himself to die. I mean, those people were approaching the World Trade Center, the towers, in order to die. 
I mean, the Susan Zontag, a very important uh, intellectual figure in, in the United States, she died. She said, we can accuse the so-called terrorists of anything, but not that they didn't have courage. Well, of course, I mean, they had an immense courage. I couldn't do something like this for anything in the world. And they did it. Uh, and not only that, to have the knowledge, the know-how to actually uh, direct the plane towards the towers. I, I still don't believe this happened, but apparently it did happen. And actually I went to New York about two weeks later because I was actually leaving the country. And uh, uh, um, I remember at LaGuardia airport. So it was two weeks after September 11 at LaGuardia airport. There were many militaries, you know, with rifles, you know, every corner of the street on the airport. And around uh, the World Trade Center, around where the tragedy happened, it was closed for many blocks. And it was a smell in the air because of the, the incredible uh, thing that happened there. You know, it, 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 it was, a, it transformed New York. New York, I read in a, in a, in a, in a plane that was bringing me from London to, to Bucharest, I was reading that a, a journalist said, I went, I had been, I, I went to uh, uh, New York 40 times before September 11. And New York always gave me the impression that it's a city that on one hand never sleeps, is a city that is able to take in any tragedy and, and transform it into a victory overnight that is quite capable of rejuvenating itself continuously. And it's true, the vitality of New York City took a terrible hit then, and it took them 10 years, which, you know, in terms of New York is almost inconceivably long as time to build another tower. Something happened to the New York man, uh, uh, psyche, to, to their soul, to their mentality. Something was broken because it's true, this was a, a trauma of unbelievable dimensions. And uh, anyway, this is the building that uh, Minoru Yamasaki built, uh, the inside one of the towers. I had been here, I never climbed to the top floor as most tourists do, but I had been in the, in the hallway. I, I know, impressive because the ceiling is very tall, was very tall and, uh, and so on. As I said, I had a friend, an architect who worked here and I visited him once or twice. But I, I think here again, uh, Yamasaki uh, is a little bit, uh, you know, he had a problem with this uh, academic, uh, you know, uh, desire he had to give something a little bit so-called classical. He, he didn't need it, but uh, maybe this in part, uh, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, gave him some, uh, I don't know, uh, credit in the world of, of possible clients and so on. But I, I still think he, he did a good job to an extent because, because of the fact that he imagined two towers. This was a, a, good, a good decision. I don't know if the client wanted this or he proposed this. I don't know, but from the picture in the lower right corner, we'll say that uh, he seemed to be kind of proud for uh, his achievement then. And he, did, he does seem kind of like a modest man if we judge from the picture in the lower right corner. Um, a hard working man with a rectangle and a T-square and a rather modest uh, drafting board, not the flamboyant, uh, drafting board uh, three or four times bigger than Frank Lloyd Wright had in uh, Thaliès. Anyway. Uh, no, 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 and, and many people miss actually the, the old World Trade Center. You know, the, the identity of, of the city was severely um, uh, affected by what happened. And the new World Trade Center is not matching these two. First is just one tower, and that was a mistake. Uh, to make just one tower. And uh, yes, probably it's built forever, but uh, as uh, Bansky, that, uh, then, that uh, you know, irreverent uh, artist, uh, street artist uh, said, uh, 
the tower belonged to be to Canada, not to New York City. Uh, he was malicious towards Canada because Canada doesn't have the, the demonic qualities of, uh, of, of New York City. Anyway, um, in essence, Manhattan is a city of, uh, you know, of, uh, of the merchants, of the, of the, of, of the money makers. It's, it's, it's capitalism blooming. And now there are, of course, other cities that are blooming in the same direction, but New York was for many years uh, the paradigm. We see on the left the Empire State Building and here all kinds of uh, so-called, uh, you know, developments that are not of the most pure kind. Still, the, the World Trade Center had a certain, uh, <laughs> if nothing else, a certain verticality in the good sense of the word. And it did define the, the, the silhouette of the city. Now I'll show you some, uh, some so again, the World Trade Center was, was built by the architect. We are paying homage to him now uh, today because he was born on December 1st. That's Minoru Yamasaki, a Japanese American architect. He was born in the States, but from Japanese uh, immigrants, from, from Japanese parents. Now I'll just show just quickly through some proposals for the World Trade Center that were not built. This is one and it's not uh, without interest. I don't know exactly what the function was supposed to be. Uh, it's just, you know, mimicking. It's just a skeleton, the carcass of the two towers um, done in this way. And I, I, I think it's rather interesting. And uh, it was not built, but uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a remembrance, an echo, uh, a shadow, a luminous shadow, if I am to express myself uh, oxymoronically, of the, of the previous towers. Anyway, it was not built. This is the, the building proposed by, uh, by Lipskin, who won the competition in the end, but he didn't build it. The World Trade Center now was built by uh, David uh, Childs of uh, SOM, Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, uh, <laughs> they, they kind of uh, subtracted the job from uh, Daniel Lipskin. I don't know how they succeeded. Now these buildings, they exist. They had nothing to do with the, with the World Trade Center, but this one, the uh, grid-like uh, squared one, this is by Peter Eisenman. And actually there are two, and uh, uh, two, I, I cannot call them two buildings. There are actually five. But, but I, I think he didn't do a, a bad job here, you know. Um, I think uh, if there is a quality in the work, and I think there is, is the fact that he went further to uh, sabotage the monolithical structure of, of capitalism. And, and he created actually five towers united by the horizontal slabs. And, he brought in some, uh, he, he, he irritated, he sabotaged the monopoly of power. And I think in that sense, he do, did a positive thing. I, if this was built, I think it would have been better than what was built, uh, you know, by David Charles and, and so on. And um, yeah, uh, I, I think even in this proposal, uh, Peter Eisenman, uh, uh, did something that, uh, you know, makes one think. And uh, I think it would have been, it could have been uh, a, viable, um, a vi viable proposal, but it was not built. Uh, anyway, there is also the reference to number five, you know, the David, David Starr. Uh, you know, Eisenman is a complex uh, man and a complex uh, spirit. So, uh, but but I think he, he he did something interesting here, and I, I regret it was not built. And it could have been built very easily, really. Uh, yeah, I think its main quality is the fact that he fragmented uh, and and thus he sabotaged the the monolith. And, and, and still would have been some reference to the previous towers, those that fell. 
not a not a bad job, I think, by by uh, uh, Peter Eisenman. Now here we see something else, more exotic, more flamboyant, more uh, exasperated in a way. I don't know. This I think I'm not sure if this is not by uh, Greg Lean. I think it is. Greg Lean teaches at uh, IOA in uh, Austria in Vienna. And then we have this one uh, more uh, agitated and agitating. I don't know who did it. Uh, there were many, many, many proposals. I will end by showing a, a thought, a proposal. Uh, I don't know if it was sent to New York by um, someone who teaches at the university here, a Romanian uh, architect who also studied for his doctorate in Barcelona. I'm talking about Justin Baronja. And I will end by reading a short text about his project that might have some relevance to a possible discussion afterwards. These are also, I would say, interesting. But from, from, from what I've seen until now, I still appreciate the most the proposal by uh, Peter Eisenman. Now, here we see, of course, uh, Bjarke Ingels with this, I would say, rather simplistic uh, tower he proposed, but he proposed it not in, in place of the, of the World Trade Center. This is the World Trade Center as, as it was built now. And I, I am tempted to think that what Minoru Yamasaki did was better than what the David Childs did. And uh, there were probably proposals better than this one, but this one was built. And this is what uh, Big and uh, Ingels proposed, but was not built. And I hope it will not be built because I don't think it's so, uh, so glorious. Now, uh, what should I do? Uh, should I show you? I have three more images and the text. Maybe I show you the, the, the images first. This was my small uh, art and architecture gallery in, in uh, Chicago. Um, and you see here the proposal by Justin Baroncha, inspired by the, the, the embrace of the kiss by Brancusi, by Brancusi the, the important Romanian sculptor. And I think he had a good idea to, to have a white tower and a black tower embracing each other, because really what happened then uh, must be challenged from the position of peace and understanding and embracing one another. I wrote a text and I will read you this text, which at that time I exposed, I, I showed on, on, the, on the, the glass of the, of the gallery. I'll show you two more pictures, this one. Uh, and um, well, there is a problem with this proposal. These two, if they are squares, these two towers, they are, they are uh, um, how to say, they, they, they are um, aligned while the towers by Minoru Yamasaki were not al aligned. They were, they were um, how to say, um, um, I, I have to show the site plan and I, I don't have it here, but they were not aligned. These are aligned, so this is actually more static than what, uh, what uh, Minoru Yamasaki did. But it's still, I think, an interesting idea to have a black tower and a white tower that embrace each other. And the inspiration is this sculpture by uh, Constantin Brunkush, which is indeed quite uh, inspiring. And it is indeed honoring the very root of the word art, because art in the old, uh, oldest definition or the etymology that I found means bridge and, and through extension, God. And so you see here Brunkush and we see here Justin Baroncha. And now I will read a, a short, sorry, a, a short uh, a text I wrote about this project. Uh, just a second, uh, I have it here. Okay, so um, another proposal for WTC, World Trade Center. It is hard to think that a new proposal for the World Trade Center could be made, even if the possibilities are in fact endless. I wrote this before the, the tower by David Childs was built. Yet if one contemplates the winning design by Daniel Lipskin, because he won the competition, but it was not built what he proposed, one is faced with dilemmas. The artificiality of the professed so-called dialogue between the so-called Freedom Tower 
in many respects, the only symbolically significant part of the project. I am referring here only to the towers per se, and the Statue of Liberty is it easily noticeable. Plus, there is a certain demagogy, even opportunism, in the choice of symbols and their formal representation. But these lines are actually not meant to criticize Lipsky's project, but to bring to the public attention an original project for the Twin Towers by the Romanian architect Justin Baroncea. Inspired by the famous sculpture that is by Constantin Brâncuș, his proposal is quite valid in many ways. Not only that it connects with the previous towers, tragically fallen in terms of their aesthetic vocabulary and the very idea of twinness, but it actually moves beyond the simplistic formalism of those towers and invests them with a new, strong, symbolic content externalized appropriately. The world today is quite a dangerous place. Perhaps it, all, it was always so, but it was never so in terms of our capacity for self-destruction. This is obviously well known, yet we continue quite predictably the ideology of competition and war, of segregation and even hatred. To the provocation of September 11, we respond with symmetrical, maybe even amplified provocations. The old story of not turning the other cheek, the old story of responding to violence with increased violence. People die at this very moment as a consequence of this. I, I was referring to the war in Iraq. The W, you see the WT, and then I placed a question mark after T because that word means, that initial means trade. See, but Justin Baronja anthropologizes architecture in a healthy way by expressing powerfully a simple idea. By extending one's arms towards the other one, we create as the basis for dialogue, if not love, as in Brancus culture. Make love, not war, the famous slogan of the 60s becomes now architectural flesh, but with a seriousness, even with a gravity that the 60s didn't really have. One tower is black, the other one is white. So opposition, even conflict are acknowledged, but they are transgressed through the reciprocal extension of arms. Maybe one would object to the obvious anthropocentrism of the project, yet this very anthropocentrism was in fact initiated by the previous towers, the twins. Not only that, but the connection formal and otherwise between the human body and the tower has a long history and it works the other way as well. As for example, when some of the New York architects who build skyscrapers, built uh, skyscrapers before the war, dressed up a skyscraper on the occasion of a carnival. So then why not insinuate in the very anatomy of the skyscraper, a possible human silhouette? But in fact, Baroncha does not propose a facile mimetis. Beyond the formal analogies, this is the mythical meeting and possible conflict between two opposite forces, one white, the other one black, who find harmony in the act of conjunction. As such, the project has alchemical overtones, conjunctio oppositorum, in the act of love, differences are conquered, and the golden stone of alchemy is thus found. But beyond these more or less esoteric possible interpretations stands clear cut and for all to see the very powerful, almost totemic presence of the proposal. Two towers clearly derived formally from the previous towers in the act of a redeeming embrace. It does seem indeed that as such, the pair achieves in its togetherness a power that individually was absent. Not only that the towers seem to be indestructible because infallibly united by love, but they also communicate the message that in fact they have nothing to fear since their being does not threaten anyone. The whole proposal could make one think of Zhu and I by Martin Buber, that book that wisely tried to convince us that indeed I am Zhu, uh, I am Zhu, and who is I? It is not, is it not this the message of all great religions? But to return and to end, in a world of human competition, segregation, 
hatred and ultimately war, and thus endless suffering and death. These two embracing towers might be exactly what we need. Beyond the propaganda of a somewhat demagogical and arrogant form of freedom, so-called freedom, in whose name people continue to die every day, here stands a project that advocates without demagogy and even without illusions, peace. And maybe the name for such an architectural proposal shouldn't be World Trade Center, but World Embrace Center, W-E-C. This, if we are, uh, just a second. This, if we are not mature enough to still believe that indeed love is or can be, that force is preferable at all levels to war. I was sarcastic here because, you know, we think that, that the mature ones prefer war and aggressivity instead of love. What a better proof from the mightiness of this country than to show that it can respond to violence not with ever more amplified violence, but with an act of love, even towards the ones unjust to her, as in this instance. What a better act of generosity and even wisdom than to build two towers, not just for New York and not just for the United States, but for the whole world, proclaiming yes to life in a way that the shreds of the approved design at this moment barely whisper. Well, I was referring to the proposal by Daniel Lipskin, which in the end was not uh, was not built. So let's look again, uh, if you want, at the uh, you know at, at the pictures of the. But if, you know, somehow my computer doesn't allow me uh, to. to uh, you saw it. You saw the pictures. I was hoping, for some reason, it. Ah, I, I know what happened. This is uh, this is not the PowerPoint presentation. The PowerPoint presentation is here. So yeah, this is what he did. And I just read to you, if you know, maybe you thought it was a little bit uh, long, the text that was displayed on, on this uh, glass here. So this is the proposal for the World Embrace Center, as, as I called it, not Justin Baroncha. Uh, and uh, I don't even know if he sent it to uh, New York, but there is something that I like about this proposal. OK, thank you very much. Uh, be tired, but uh, uh, I prefer to be tired than uh, frightened by uh, boredom or uh, who knows what. Okay, actually, it's an interesting presentation uh, about uh, New York rising again because since we talked about uh, the World Trade Center falling, maybe it's high time to 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 talk a little bit about uh, New York's New York rising again. And if, if, not, if not New York rising again, I don't know what. So New York rising again, Edgar Street Tower. This was just a proposal by Eva Moto Scott Architecture or Architects. You see how things changed from uh, Minoru Yamasaki to what was built by David Childs and even the proposal by uh, uh, Bjarke Ingels. We already have here twisting architectures. You know, why are these towers twisting? Well, they are twisting, I think, first, because there is a disbelief in a, a Cartesian architecture. It's some kind of a reaction to uh, almost a phobia to, uh, you know, explicit uh, Cartesianism. And, and uh, many people twist their architectures uh, these days. And this is just one example. But again, keep in mind what Minoru Yamasaki did, and we live at a different time. And this was not built, but there are many other examples of uh, twisted towers. You see here the tower that replaced the World Trade Center, and that was built by uh, SOM and David Childs in lieu, in place of what Daniel Lipskin proposed. And this is a proposal for another tower not far away from it, that expresses a different, uh, a different kind of architecture. We also have here two towers, and it's kind of interesting. And here we also have some kind of a, uh, interaction and some kind of embrace. It's more erotical, it's less spiritualized, but we have two towers that, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> seem to be connected, all right, aren't they? You know, in a little bit uh, angst-driven way, but uh, maybe uh, uh, you know, uh, 
certain painter from uh, Vietnam, from Austria would agree with this. And the interior, of course, represents our time. It's, it's, it's contorted, it's conflictual, it's, uh, it's a little bit mad because the times we live in are mad. And, uh, and uh, of course, madness always existed, but somehow in our time we're, we are able to express it through, through our buildings. Uh, I, I was referring to Egon Schiller, the, the Austrian architect who was an uh, artist who was quite able to, to express the, the angst of the body in its contortions and in, in its longings and in its desires. That's what I see here. Here also we might see a certain reference to the Gothic times, but in a very different way from what Minoru Yamasaki did. Their form. Uh, this is a young uh, practice, uh, totally nuts. They don't uh, build for human beings, they build for insects. Yes, there is a trend now that, that we shouldn't any longer build for human beings, but we should have concern for other beings, but not human. This is a structure, they built a pavilion. This is a non-for-profit organization that does research and uh, you know, promotes uh, uh, you know, so-called uh, future architecture, future trends in architecture. New York is very good at, at, at doing this. You know. they, they, they push the frontiers. They, they, they are pioneers. They, they break new ground. They search for new things. They simply cannot accept the status quo. And I love this about New York and New Yorkers. You know, they, 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 it's a continuous lap. Unfortunately, yes, it is governed by capitalists, by money interests, but there are also pockets of resistance. And this is one of them. Now we see uh, the Frank Gehry Towers uh, in Manhattan, which were built. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think Frank Gehry is so good at building towers. Uh, but he tried, he tried to bring a little bit of fluidity, uh, Berninian fluidity to his tower, which otherwise is essentially, uh, you know, a Cartesian structure, but he just modulated the, the facades uh, and uh, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the additional costs, uh, inevitably. What I see here is what uh, Eisenman uh, promoted. You start with a grid, with a Cartesian uh, you know, grid and, and structure, and then you begin to problematize it. And this is what uh, um, Frank Gehry did in this project, really. But what is, in a way, amazing is that it was built just as he envisioned it, or almost. But you see again the, 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 the new tendency to, to get out of the priest, to, to uh, irritate the priest through fluidity and contortions and what I call the, the wrinkles of the, of the building. Because uh, for too long we had forgotten the wrinkles and maybe wrinkles should not be forgotten. But otherwise the building is not really great because you see here, you know, the, the cuts, you see the, it's, it's essentially a Cartesian building that he just, uh, uh, you know, try to make a little more like uh, Bernini-like a little bit, but um, I don't think he succeeded in this project greatly. Dealers Cofidio and Renfro. Now they made this, I think this building is good. And look what they did. They here there is a prism as well, but they honor the, 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 the big street in front of it with the opening up the public spaces, which are also circulations. So they become hybrid spaces. The, there are uh, stairs that become amphitheaters and amphitheaters that become stairs. So the viscerality of the building is a reality that they are not afraid to externalize. And I think they did a good job. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the, such a project might not be very appreciated here in school, especially, but I think it should be appreciated because it's the public dimension of architecture. It's there where you have meetings, embraces, shaking hands, conflicts, fights, and so on. It's, it's the dynamics of the social life. And you are not going to hide the dynamics of the social life behind the placid facade. It, it, it's not right. So anyway, uh, it was built 
and it's uh, I think it's part of the Columbia University uh, campus. Or anyway, it's it's across the street from Columbia University. This is New York, continuously changing, continuously bringing in the new, uh, challenging itself. And I love this about New York. Now the Campbell uh, Campbell uh, Sports Center by Stephen Hall. Uh, another, you know, you would say experimental building, and it was, uh, I don't know if it was not built for uh, the police or something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's uh, still a Stephen Hall building, a phenomenological building, if I can say so, and, um, and, and why not? Uh, it's, it's, it's a building that uh, has uh, broken parts that you can see the city through it, uh, and uh, you know, not everything responds to a strict, the strict rigor of rationalism. Look at these stairs, how they come out of the building and then climb, they climb on the, on the building like some kind of a, you know, a geometrical snake. It's fine. Medusa's head to an extent, but the, the, the snake is, uh, you know, geometrical, not, not really fluid. But the idea, the attempt is just like in the previous building to break the skin to communicate with the street, to communicate with what is outside of the building. It's a desire of the building to, to, to become porous in the sense that to, that to communicate with the outside. And um, he did it, it was built. Uh, so, the tectonics maybe are a little bit cold, but uh, Otherwise, and, and these are the typical watercolors of Stephen Hall that he enjoys so much uh, doing, you know, uh, and that's how he conceptualizes his, uh, his projects. You see here, mind, body, mind, you know, a, 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 you know, for a sports center, what architect would also think about so you have two separation, uh, separation there. You have the separation between the mind and the body, and then you have the mind and the body together in the in the part of, on the right side of uh, of this sketch. Okay, now Jean Nouvel. He couldn't miss the occasion. Uh, Jean Nouvel, this, I have seen this building with my own eyes, so to speak, but I, I, I was in a taxi, but I, I saw it. And I, he did a much better job than Frank Gehry, who built a building right across the street. I like, this is by Frank Gehry here, and this is by Jean Nouvel. And I think Jean Nouvel did a good job because he was able to, again, when you sabotage, sabotage the monolith, uh, you give a chance to the voice unheard, you know, at what is on the periphery. So when he uh, fragmented the facade in this way, he, he obtained that difficult conjunction between the monolithical structure, the single voice, and the, the voice of the many, or the voices of the many, symbolized here through these many windows that are difficult even to, to figure out very well. But uh, uh, he also introduced an aleatory movement here. You know, it's, it's the value of chance encounters, it's the value of, of variation. And I, I think he did a good job. Uh, um, you know, I mean, just compare with, the, with this building or with this one, you know. The, this one is, a, is like the foliage of a tree in the spring. It's, 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 it, 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 it vibrates, it, it, it is alive. Although essentially it's still a you know steel and glass building, and it's still based on Cart Cart Cartesian a Cartesian structure, but he was able to 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 move it to to create this this uh, verbiage, if I am to use the French word, uh, um, that is um, not easy to achieve, particularly you know in a Cartesian mode. Now this is another building by Jean Nouvel, which is completing now uh, the pandemic complete, uh, um, made uh, some difficulties uh, impossible to avoid, but it's almost done. And he fought for this tower a lot uh, because uh, he, you know, he, he needed all kinds of uh, signatures and approvals from the city and maybe even funds. But it's done now, it's built, it's almost finished. 
and it's quite tall. It's here. So, um, and it's it's a very Gothic building. And this was my impression when I first entered uh, uh, New York that it is a Gothic city. And you say, what are you talking about? Yes, this was my impression. Yes, the streets are not sinuous; they are straight. But because the buildings are very tall, I mean, yes, the streets are wide, but because the buildings are very tall, they seem to be narrow. So there is a certain darkness uh, to, to New York. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I thought it was something, it is a medieval city. And it seems that Jean Nouvel uh, uh, had a deep, uh, similar perception because his, his, his proposal, which was built like this uh, is, uh, I would say, a rather modern medieval tower. And look at the structure. You know, it's a structure which uh, is like like the web of a spider, and uh, and that's not bad, because it's about weaving actually. Of course, look at what scale. I mean, we are dealing here with structural elements of huge dimensions, but unconventionally placed on the on uh, for the building at various angles as you can see here well it's a powerful city uh, unfortunately now with the pandemic uh, some people leave it it's it's a tragedy but uh, still this is a very potent city and too bad it, it is uh, governed by uh, yes by money but uh, well this is capitalism maybe without that uh, Manhattan would not have looked like, and not just Manhattan, the whole of New York, the way it does. Uh, okay, so Jean Nouvel uh, in, in Manhattan. Uh, here we see, this is the new World Trade Center built after the fall of the Twin Towers. This is the Empire State Building and then uh, uh, Jean Nouvel's uh, tower. I, I love this, even in this embroidered structure of his tower because that's what it is. It is an embroidered uh, tower, you know, and uh, this is not easy to do. And uh, I think he did a good job. In fact, I like, I like it more in these uh, renderings or these, these uh, models, these modelings than in uh, perhaps in, in the built uh, reality. Here, there is also something of the, the idealism of the Russian constructivists with a little bit of touch of, of the Gothic that I keep seeing. And uh, well, here you see the Central Park and here Central Park West. And here around here somewhere probably John Lennon was killed in front of the Dakota building where he was living. Uh, yeah. So this is the Upper East Side where the very rich live. This is the Upper West Side, but there are also well-to-do people here like I just mentioned John Lennon. And uh, you know, uh, anyway, it's a, it's it's a big city and uh, with a big story. But you see, the building by Jean Nouvel is uh, has a different silhouette, and this is the ability of Jean Nouvel to continuously rejuvenate himself and through him architecture. Now, the Stephen Hall Library, which provokes some uproar, uh, it's an interesting building. Uh, here I have pictures which are not with a finalized building. It's actually in Queens, but uh, um, which is a, some kind of a neighborhood, a suburb. It's not really a suburb. It's, it's, it's not Manhattan. It's Queens. Uh, I think he broke very interestingly this uh, concrete box, but he was reproached, and I think he was even sued that he didn't provide uh, access to the handicapped people. Uh, but he probably resolved that in some way. Um, Anyway, uh, Jean Nouvel, uh, I mean, uh, Stephen Hall is still an architect who is able to, to make us, um, you know, wonder a little bit. The only problem I have with this building is the entrance door, which is just a hole in the, in the wall. Here he is. I, I hope I have a picture with, uh, with the entrance. It might be this one, actually. It's very static and predictable and uneventful. I'm not against uneventfulness, but uh, here is a, a little bit problematic when the building is so interesting and contorted. Uh, I mean, it is a box, but look at these openings. And then you just have this 
you know, very prosaic entrance into the building. I, I don't think he was very inspired there. But some of his uh, watercolors that he does near a lake in complete solitude, he doesn't have electricity there and he doesn't have uh, uh, water. He's just uh, it's his uh, meditation chapel. And that's where he does some of his, his projects. Here he is, um, uh, you know, signing on the, on the <laughs> you know, on the building uh, at one point. This is a remarkable man. I mean, I hope he will get the Pritzker Prize, but it doesn't matter the Pritzker Prize. He has other, 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 other victories in his life. For example, he got married at 72 with one of his students who is 50 years younger, and he became a father at 72, and again now at 74 or 75. Can you believe it? This is like in the Old Testament. You know, he's, uh, he doesn't seem to be a human. Uh, <laughs> and he also builds and he also does watercolors every single day and he also paints and he builds all over the world and and he I don't think he builds so uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know to, to 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 ignore what he does now anyway um, an interesting man and 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 Stephen Hall said and it is a pleasure for me to quote from him remain idealistic. The soul needs the ideal more than the real. This we should never forget. And this is a North American and North Americans are pragmatic. But it was a North American who said, remain idealistic. The soul needs the ideal more than the real. We should say it continuously because he is right. He has the courage to talk about the soul Although he teaches at Columbia University and the student from Columbia University told me once, well, many years ago that um, the school, in the school, the word soul is not pronounced. It's wrong. Stephen Hall pronounced it and even in writing and even in a video, the soul needs the ideal more than the real. This we should never forget and work for the soul first and then for the brain and who knows what else. Here he is with, uh, with uh, Zaha Hadid. Actually, I, I was invited once in this uh, studio. He was leaving there. I don't know when this picture was taken, but I want to tell you on this uh, shelving, which is a steel shaving, you know, maybe bought from Home Depot or something, nothing pretentious. I saw two books by two Romanians. I became, uh, you know, emotional and uh, patriotic. One was The Sacred and the Profane by Mircea Eliade. He had it exactly on this library. And then another little book that I didn't know anything about, The Geometry of Art and Life by Matila Gika. I knew nothing about Matila Gika, but when I saw the name Matila Gika, I thought he must be Romanian. And indeed he was Romanian. And that book was even known by Le Corbusier because it is a book about proportions, about uh, harmonic relationships and uh, the relationship between geometry and, and, and art and life. A very interesting book. So Stephen Hall was reading and he had these two books on his, uh, in, in his library. Uh, we need this kind of architects badly. People who are curious, who are highly creative, who are idealistic, uh, who read incessantly, who do watercolors, who build all over the world, and also make children at 72 and 75. We need such people. Uh, they are hard to come by. Santiago Calatrava, the World Trade Center transportation hub opens to the public in the financial district. This is uh, another bonanza by Santiago Calatrava. <laughs> you know, really this has to stop. I mean, uh, you know, uh, it's a threatening building actually. <laughs> There were many protests. Parents were protesting that the children get scared because look at those spikes. They are huge. They are immense. You know, it's 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 Calatrava gone mad. Uh, and uh, yes, it looks like a cathedral, but is it supposed to look like a cathedral? After all, it's just a you know a station, a transportation station. You know. Uh, it's not a cathedral. Sorry, Mr. Calatrava, I don't agree with you here. Many other people don't agree with you. But 
but you are mannerist. Sometimes you, you build interesting things, but uh, you are mannerist. You know, there is some kind of a uh, uh, expressionist technique, uh, you know, a technical expressionist, you know, because he is an engineer and you can tell he's an engineer. He's not a person to ignore, of course, but uh, this kind of grandeur with the inevitable uh, spendings, I don't think it was justified for uh, for this function, and uh, it, it's just it's uh, white uh, white uh, demagogy. And look at this, I mean these skypes with these with these pipes, you could have built uh, you know n uh, apartment buildings, and its symbolism is ridiculous actually. You know this kind of uh, you know bird again. He also used it in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and in other buildings. You know, it's just too much. And many people complained. I don't know if I have here. I have a presentation on Santiago Calatrava with quotations from newspapers and all kinds of people who accuse him of the same things I, I mentioned. He also uh, started to build, and I imagine he's finalized, this Greek Orthodox Church at ground zero. Uh, <laughs> you know, the Greek Orthodox Church is still the Greek Orthodox Church, but Calatrava is still Calatrava. So here we had some negotiation between a stubborn church and a stubborn engineer. So, uh, you know, uh, he's building something a little more interesting than what the, 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 the Orthodox uh, Church uh, builds, at least here. So it seems the church, the Greek Orthodox Church, is still open to a certain level of uh, innovation, uh, to a certain extent. Let's not uh, get carried away here by the illusion that uh, this stubborn church would allow for too much freedom. But, you know, they, they still hired uh, Calatrava, who is not a Christian, by the way. Anyway, but then also St. John the Divine Cathedral hired Calatrava to do its echo uh, addition, ecological addition for St. John the Divine Cathedral. Uh, he won the competition, but I don't think it was built. Anyway, Thomas Heatherwick, of course, how could he miss the occasion? With his, uh, you know, uh, the, I like this image. I like this labyrinth. I like the, you know, the, the viscerality. But what I don't like is him from, from afar. From afar, it, it is like a, I don't know, a uh, Christmas tree upside down. And it's just um, odd. Maybe the experience within it is not bad, I hope. But uh, I, I don't know, it's too object-like. And it's actually static. But within it, there is an interesting movement. And I particularly like these images during the process of construction. Because here we see the, the, the complexity of it all. And uh, these are huge, and uh, I, I just like, I, I would have stopped it right here, not, not go further. But, you know, it's a system. This is what bothers me. It's a system, and it's explicitly a system. Um, but you can still take interesting pictures, you know, from various points of the structure. And I guess, I guess you can look at the city once you are tired of using elevators, but of course now the pandemic complicates everything. Most of these things I imagine are rather empty, you know, uh, it, we, we live in a different world for, for the moment. Um, so this is the rendering he created for a, for a, a pre-pandemic world. Here he is, uh, the, the British man who never studied architecture by design, but he builds all right, and, uh, and not just in Great Britain and, and the United States, in Singapore as well, and in some other places, uh, bravo to him. And uh, again, it shows that when you have something to say and you fight for some kind of an ideal for your soul or your brain or for both, Something could happen if you are a little bit lucky and persistent. Herzog and de Moron, of course, they had to be present here as well in New York. Uh, and they built a tower. What else can you build in Manhattan? Uh, Stephen Hall was the only one who didn't build uh, uh, towers. We saw two buildings by him, which were rather low for, for uh, now the library is in Queens, not in Manhattan, but still is New York. 
I don't know what to say about this tower about Herzog and Den Boron. It could have been by them or some other people. I, 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 it's okay. Even Alvaro Cesar built a tower here. You know, they are all flocking to Manhattan to build a tower. But I don't think it's such an exceptional work by Herzog and Den Boron. They have more interesting works than this one. And of course, this building is not for everybody. These are very, 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 very expensive building uh, apartments. You know, you can buy here anything under a million or five or ten. Or I mean, we are talking here about uh, a clientele that is not, um, you know, uh, on our side, so to speak. And I wonder, you know, how much of satisfaction can architects have actually in, 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 the, in, in, in you know, in these segregations? I don't admire them for this tower. I have other buildings. I know other buildings by them that are, are, are more interesting than this one. But but still being said, it was built. Those uh, cantilever parts are still functioning. Uh, uh, you know, it's well built, and look how they erect these tall, tall buildings. It's, it's just unbelievable. They have the technology. These these New Yorkers, they know they can build. But if you look at this monolith, the World Trade Center now, and what they did, uh, somehow I like this a little bit more. Although here, some might, might say there is some kind of oblique reference, or not so oblique, to the to the to the previous towers being hit by the plane in a certain way. Anyway, um, I guess it's not so bad. But the interior is rather depressingly morose. It's it's grayish. It's all this concrete, you know. And 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 when you think about these millionaires, these uh, yuppies, you know. Uh, uh, entering this building, which has an austerity, which is actually lying. You know, it is lying because the cynicism of the interior is saying nothing about the sweetness and the hallmark mentality of the people who live there. And yes, another boredom here, you know, the health club, you know, uh, you take the car in order to go to the health club in order to ride the bicycle, which goes nowhere. But we have to keep in shape. The problem is the virus, COVID, is not allowing us any longer to do this. Of course, we had to have a swimming pool, uh, no doubt. Uh, and uh, no, not everyone would be, of course, allowed here. And this uh, rather macabre uh, you know, uh, public space within the building, uh, it's something about Herzog and the Moron that sometimes turns me off. Um, not that they, <laughs> not that this matters to them in any way. That's not what I'm trying to say. The PS1 experiments. This is a public school in Queens, where I had the once myself an exhibition, and uh, on a corridor of it. It was a former public school that became a museum of art, and now is quite prestigious and famous. It's actually part of the uh, Metropolitan uh, Museum of Modern Art. I will see the Young Architects Pavilion 2017, uh, and uh, they do all kinds of experiments. The you know the theme is let's remember New York is rising again. How computer aided organic architecture could change the city of the future. Here we have some uh, uh, you know atavistic structures done with a. Uh, with an organic material that uh, you know some kind of bricks were built of I uh, think of some mushroom material and they erected these structures which I think they are interesting because they are you know organic and uh, they are at the same time rather austere and, and primitivistic and uh, and fundamentalistic and yet they have something of the present of the the aesthetics of the present you see MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, PS1. Uh, I, I like this work. And uh, they ex experiment continuously, these people. And I, I like this fact that, uh, you know, it's true. New York never sleeps. Uh, although they had been affected by, uh, by uh, you know, September 11th. OK. We move to other works at PS1, other experiments, other young architects who are uh, restless and want to innovate and create new things. 
and good for them. And you see lots of people, they're extremely curious, just like on our Zoom platform, where every day there are hundreds of people very curious to comment, to discuss, to learn new things. I'm so pleased that we have the same kind of exuberance and interest like they had the Really, it's amazing the similarity. Uh, now, Hernan Diaz Alonso, who runs now SciArc in Los Angeles, and uh, he did here pavilion, and actually a friend of ours here on Zoom, Bruce Denzinger, he did a structure for what you are going to see this. I found out when I presented this, I don't know, a few months ago, and he happened to be here on Zoom and he said, I did the structure of this and I believe it. You know, look what they did. I mean, this was done with, with using Maya. This is how the project was generated. And then the, 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 the engineer, Bruce uh, Denzinger, he uh, made this thing feasible. And uh, he even, though he was very modest and he said this was not rocket science, I don't know. I mean, let's just think about what our engineers would say if you present to them such a scheme. You know, how would they do it? Because you you break away from the from the paradigmatic uh, Cartesian paradigm from the paradigmatic uh, Cartesian structure. What do you do? You know, here is something else. A friend of mine called this. You know, these are leaves, prunes, the leaves. And look at these people, look at the New Yorkers, you know, again, it's a different society. It's interesting in experiments. It's, it's I, I mean, I'm not trying to idealize it. It's, and it's very possible. Some of these people, if not many, are not architects, but, but they love to, 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 they love the new shop. These are three partners. Uh, it happens that I know them and I'm envious of them. They are quite good. And, uh, the last one is, I think, the main designer, uh, Greg Pasquarelli. Greg Pasquarelli, who asked in 2018 what he recommends architects and students of architecture, he said, on one hand, I recommend history, theory, philosophy. And on the other hand, the newest uh, digital uh, techniques. Well, are we doing it? I doubt it. Look what they built using the newest uh, digital technologies. Well, they built other buildings, but this was their first building, uh, this structure at PS1. And it, it, it seems to be, you know, done almost uh, in a, in a um, you know, analog way, but it's actually done digitally. And uh, so you bring in the, the freedom of uh, analog work, uh, uh, almost ad hoc work uh, uh, into a, a building that is actually generated uh, digitally. They have a big uh, firm now and look what they built. They, this big arena, sports arena, the birthplace in, in, uh, in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, again, you could not have done this unless you knew digital techniques very, very, very well. And uh, they even have an, uh, you know, a lab for experiments. They even work in construction themselves. It's a large firm and they are doing very well. I like these towers that they built. You see, talking about, it's almost, they didn't know anything about the, the, the scheme that you, you, Steam Baroncha proposed. This is not on the site of World Trade Center. But I think there is a dialogue with the previous towers that fell. We have two towers that are connected here, but these towers, that if they have a certain movement, they are not straight. And uh, I think it's a very subtle work. It's in the big, these two towers are discreetly dancing. Uh, and they are not embracing each other like in the scheme by uh, Justin Baroncha explicitly, but there is a connection between them. It's called the American Copper Buildings. And uh, sometimes in the light of the West, meaning the, the setting sun, they look great. Uh, and uh, I really think they did a great job and it's very difficult because, you know, the, this, is, this is not really an organic architecture, but just look at the, the, the uh, you know, the, the slight break here in the continuity of the surface. 
So immediately they, 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 they differentiate themselves from the buildings nearby. There is another good thing in these buildings from what I understood, and I don't know if, if the architects, architects had, had something to say here, but uh, I, hope, I, I like to think that they did. But here there are a mixture, there is a mixture of uh, various uh, uh, people, some of them uh, disadvantaged financially. They uh, rented uh, some apartments to a group of people who are low income. And I like this fact that you have rich people and you have poorer people, but they're all together. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's refreshing, I think, to, to fight uh, segregation and discrimination. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I think they did a good job here. And look, look at uh, in the light of the west of the setting sun, they they stand out also because of, because of the copper. So they they it was considered one of the best buildings in the world. Uh, in I think in 2017. Now uh, the, this is another uh, building by them, extremely extremely narrow and slim. Look at it. Look at this tower, and it was built. I mean, yes, it's a building for uh, people uh, cosmically rich, uh, unbearably rich, uh, objectionably rich, obscenely rich. I mean, one apartment is, I think it's just one apartment per floor. It's, you know, the footprint of the building is extremely, extremely small. And it's, it's like a spike, you know, it, it's unbelievable. Today's glass ceiling is tomorrow's first floor. Dare to dream. I love this, dare to dream. Today's glass ceiling is tomorrow's first floor. Now, yes, there is a little bit of rhetoric here, a little bit of demagogy, but uh, you need it, you know, in order to, to do something like this or, you know, something else, of course. Uh, and look at the facade, it's not, it's not as you would expect it. There are ceramic tiles here, a profile that is rather complex. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, some pieces fell, but I think they could uh, they could take care of that. Uh, and uh, so it, it is a sensitively done uh, facade. It's not uh, simplistic as you might think at first. Another tower in Brooklyn that they proposed and maybe is, is being built now. Um, these people never stop. We are still in uh, in uh, in, uh, in uh, Manhattan. Actually, this is the tower in Brooklyn that they proposed right here. Uh, they also uh, did some works in housing, and I hope I have here some projects. Um, Dealer and Scofidio and Repro again. The shed. This is also an interesting building. Uh, it's a it's a huge pavilion that uh, that. Uh, <laughs> extends itself uh, through a lot of technological effort. And I hope uh, here I can illustrate it uh, accordingly. So this was built by them for artistic events, uh, you know, large uh, scale. Look at this. <laughs> you see a little bit here happening. So it, it, it's, yes, now you see it better. I'm so happy that this is happening that I, I, I can, I can uh, illustrate what I had to say with through these um, technological wonders. That's how it is built. It's, 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 uh, I mean, the wheels of this thing are huge and it is functioning, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. Now, maybe it's a little bit facile. You could say, uh, is this really what we need at the time of uh, climate change and sustainability and so on? Well, when they started this, um, people were not so concerned about them, but now they are. There is, uh, this is the Heatherwick building and they are, Diller and Scofidio are also building a skyscraper behind, behind it. Um, is this one, I don't know, uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, so Heatherwick in the front, Diller, Scofidio and Repro uh, behind. Uh, the Alice Story Hall Lincoln Center, also built by uh, Diller and Scofidio, but this is an older work by uh, Diller and Scofidio uh, with a fashionable now uh, corner entrance, which is very used uh, by many people, uh, even by themselves in a museum they built in uh, uh, Los Angeles. 
which is very appreciated. And look here, this slab, you know, covered with grass. So the grass doesn't grow on earth any longer. It grows on the slab. And they, they show that actually the earth is uh, dislocating itself from, from itself in this way, if I can uh, say something like this. They also did the New York High Line, which is a, a, a very appreciated work where they uh, transformed, uh, you know, uh, uh, subway line into uh, green space, linear. And uh, it's very appreciated by people because, you know, I don't know how it is now during the pandemic, but people work on this thing and, uh, you know, there is green, there is grass, there are flowers, there are benches, there are, you know, people running, people coming from work, people going to work, people without shoes. It's, it's about uh, bringing, bringing back some of the simple pleasures that, um, you know, living in a metropolis are not so easy to, 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 to come by. Um, so people have to walk again, you know, because they are tired of the car and, the, uh, you know, subways. And it's good to walk, yes. And the flowers participate to this joy. So this was also done by Dealer and Scofidio. And here just, you see the two worlds, the, the, the world of the cars and the world of God, in a way, the grass, the flowers. As, uh, as uh, Frank Lloyd White said, you know, when he was asked, do you believe in God? And he said, I do, but I spell it nature. He didn't say I spell it the cars. He said, I spell it nature. Okay, so this is again Dealer and Scofidio. The return, uh, I am approaching the end. Uh, the return and the revenge of the green. Indeed, there is great, great, great need for the green. Grass, flowers, plants, bushes, trees. We need oxygen. We need less pollution. We need to fix a little bit the, the problems with the climate if we could. So now New Yorkers think about ways to bring in back the green into the city. So this firm, Perkins Eastman Architects, proposed transforming the iconic Broadway to uh, convert it into a linear park, running from Columbus Circles to Union Square. Now, this would have been inconceivable, inconceivable a while ago because Broadway is a very important uh, you know, avenue in, uh, in uh, Manhattan. So the proposal was, it, it was not yet implemented and maybe it might not be soon, but the idea is not bad. Just like in the case of the High Line, to bring back the green and to extend the assault on the cars, to eliminate the cars, to, to push them aside and, and give the green to the city and to the people. And I think that's a good idea. And you see it here, the, the green is insinuating itself, is breaking in uh, Manhattan. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's the revenge of nature. That's why I called it the return and the revenge of nature. We need this all over the world, not just in Manhattan and uh, not the least in Bucharest, which is highly polluted. And we keep cutting down trees and ignoring the green, which is unbelievable. We need the green badly badly all over the world. Look at this, the triumph of nature, you know, uh, it's magnificent. Uh, yes, the work of man is impressive too, but here is represented in a grayish way. The green is, is extending its tentacles left and right and advancing, and it should. And if Frank Lloyd White was right in this case and not wrong is, as in other cases, is the return of God in a way, no? Since he spelled God as nature. Now they even created a subterranean garden. Can you believe it? In a subway station. Because again, they need the green, the low line is called the low line, not the high line, but the low line, the first underground path. It's still an experiment, but you have the picnic there. Can you imagine? where the sun didn't even enter before. A, a sophisticated technology was used to make plants actually grow underground. Can you believe it? Uh, 
yes, maybe it would not last something like this, or maybe the experiment would fail. But the, the tendency, I think, is correct. So, I mean, I'm not trying to say that it is correct to, 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 to bury nature underground, but, but what is correct is to attempt to bring back nature, to bring back the green, to bring back oxygen, because that's what the plants uh, generate, oxygen. Uh, look here, that's how it was before. And that's how it is now, a fragment. Not bad. Um, Anyway, uh, this wouldn't easily solve the problems, but it does show a problem that exists and it is addressed. And yes, we, we need the, 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 the richness of nature. We do need it. After all, we are part of it. We also have a nature within ourselves, which is not less complex and less rich. And at times when we are inspired, uh, less admirable. So move over, Reds. New York is planning an underground park. Move over, Reds. New York is planning an underground park. That's because indeed there are Reds in the subway system in, uh, in, in New York. Uh, so is the fight of New Yorkers, of New York, for, uh, for, uh, for a better life, which finds itself uh, externalized and expressed in this way, in this case. So indeed, New York is rising again, and is rising again because they cultivate experiment, because they are restlessly, uh, you know, questing for something else. They are young, and they have a vitality that I think uh, should be present in other parts of the world as well. Back to architecture, the new building of Cooper Union by Morphosis, uh, Tom Main. Uh, from yeah, Tom Main from Morphosis. He received also the Pritzker Prize. This is the famous architecture school, uh, Cooper Union. This is the new building. They, uh, they had an older building uh, um, for, for, for a long time. A very famous architecture school. Until very recently, you didn't have to pay anything if you studied there, but you had to pass a difficult exam. The new art museum by Sana. I don't know. Uh, what can I say? Maybe uh, Frank, uh, maybe Kenneth Frampton was justified in not appreciating very much the, the work of the more recent stars of uh, Japanese architecture, but maybe he was not totally right. Um, there are interesting voices, uh, you know, Toyo Ito, uh, Kazuyo Sejima, who built this, meaning Sana, uh, Ishigami, uh, Su Fujimoto, and so on. But what, what they did here is also what BRK Ingels attempted with the tower, you know, with the uh, retreating uh, cubes one above the other. This conceptually, so to speak, is not very different from what Ingels uh, did. And I actually, I think Ingels, his proposal was after uh, what um, Sana did here. It doesn't really matter. Here they are. I mean, she is with her partner. And uh, I always have problems to remember his name, unfortunately. But for, who lo for too long, we forgot the names of the women. Now is the time to forget the names of the men. So I remember her name, Kazuyo Sejima, but I, I still don't memorize, unfortunately, his name. Francis Picabi, an important painter, he said, New York is the cubist, the futurist city. It expresses in its architecture, its life, its spirit, the modern thought. Well, he made this uh, you know, many years ago, 50, 70 years ago. Then Simone de Beauvoir, there is something in, in the New York air that makes sleep useless. Indeed, she put it very well. There is something in the New York air that makes sleep useless. And here is another nice one, but uh, the resolution of the picture is small, but you can still read it. Most cities are nouns, New York's a verb. Indeed, it is a verb. Never give up on your dreams. This is indeed what New York seems to say to the world. I am not trying to say that there is no misery in the world. There is plenty of it. There are many problems. It's extremely difficult to pay your rent for many people. Uh, there is competition. There is the obsession with money, with fame and all the rest. But beyond all of this, 
there is a quest for living uh, within uh, the field of some kind of exceptionalism which is illustrated by the saying, never give up on your dreams. And uh, an image of, the, of Central Park with a, with a slim tower by a shop and other towers, mountains in New York, and I think I'll end now, the project would involve digging down to reveal the bedrock hidden. This was a project, I think, by two Chinese or Koreans, uh, young architects, a very strange uh, proposal to, in a way, to get rid of the Central Park and return to the primeval reality beyond, before even man, maybe, you know, some kind of a prehistorical vision, if I can say so. Just look at Manhattan around it. And then the revenge, the return of nature in its most ancient and primeval form. Landlock, the 100 feet deep megastructure would boast 1000 feet high walls which would encase the seven square miles of floor area. An incredible uh, you know, challenge for, uh, for anyone who wants to envision the future. But uh, uh, it's something that makes us think that indeed we seem to be at some kind of end of history and, 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 and the longing for the, 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 the deepest roots and the oldest uh, history in fact, prehistory, prior to man, actually. The Mammoth Project was designed by Itan Sun and Yan Shi Wu, who scooped first prize for the entry in the evil of skyscraper competition. But you see, it wasn't really a skyscraper. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm happy I was able to, 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 to go through this.